Some sensors that we use are intrinsically noisy and need some care to extract the most information. The sonars in particular that we use are pretty noisy, but very useful for medium range sensing. So we'd like to consider some methods to get more data out of them. I'm gonna talk about the classifier demo sketch that's on the course website. This is relatively new, uh, but I think it's a useful example of perhaps how to get some more data from sonar. So the idea is if your application can use a classification scheme, that is a method that renders a stream of data into a set of labels. And in this case, the labels I've chosen are a person is near, far, receding or approaching. So the idea is to interpret a stream of sensor readings and just label it as one of these four states that, uh, that somehow model the underlying world. If your application has that form, then this method might be applicable. And sometimes these models can be coded by hand if you're careful with how you, you know, examine the data and write some rules to process it. But here's a case where we can use database modeling. So machine learning is a very big word that means a lot of different things, but for us it's gonna mean basically data-based modeling, using a data set or labeled data to build a model that can then be interpret, used to interpret other data. And you know, very large-scale machine learning in some sense is still mostly very data-driven, very high-dimensional now, but the core concepts are not dissimilar. So the basic scheme is we're gonna set up a signal processing workflow that takes in the raw, raw sonar, sonar data and does some pre-processing, and we'll get back to that in a bit. But then we're going to collect real data from the real system using the same filters we'll use in the final product. And then we're going to hand label it. And then we're going to use a toolkit uh, called scikit-learn, which is a, a Python library that's available for free, to process that into a model and build code from that. And now I'm going to walk through a lot of these pieces and kind of show you how it looks. Um, and then we'll see how this could work. The idea is that a data-driven model can capture sort of the nuanced details of your real system and then when you, when you use it on live data, hopefully you'll get reasonable results that correspond to your training set. So that's the overall kind of scheme here. Let's just look at some of the parts. Um, so first of all, uh, let's think about, let me just show you what the data looks like, right? Just so we get agreement here. In the end, uh, after I've done some pre-filtering, it's a bunch of numbers, right? I have a, a long file of points where I, the first digit in each row here is a hand-generated label that classifies the point. And I'm using just two-dimensional data. This is basically the uh, sonar, the, the processed uh, range and range velocity of the sonar sensor that are then used as, and they're processed as integers because we're running for the Arduino here. Um, that'll be used to build some code. So let's bring that code back and take a look at it. Actually, we're going to look first at the kind of the higher order view of this. So if we take our, um, if we take our points, that file I just showed you is a bunch of two-dimensional points that represent the position that's reported by the range sensor after filtering and the computed velocity of the object, presumably, out there. And we can see there's a large cluster that are kind of close, and there's a large cluster that's kind of far, and there's some stream of points that are moving either negative or positive. And the color coding in this particular plot is showing the output of the classifier. Blue for close, red for far, green for uh, approaching, and, and orange for receding, like moving away. So that's where we're heading with all this code. This is a, a kind of plot to see this. This represents a two-dimensional tree. And to show what I mean by a tree, let's just, actually, let's look at the code first, sorry. The code that creates that tree looks like this. This is generated from a script. This is not code that you would write by hand necessarily, although you could have written this by hand. The key is it's a classifier. It takes a, a, a list of two numbers as input, an array, we call it a vector, and we're using integers because this is the Arduino, we like integers, and it returns an integer, which is a label. And that meaning you assign a label is up to you, it's in, for the purposes of the code, it's just a number, an index. So what we see is the code itself is a long series of, of if-else statements um, with less than or equal operators. And in some leaf nodes of this tree, some clauses, uh, it'll return an index. So to think about what that looks like in terms of math, right? if we have a two-dimensional plane of, uh, of points, um, what we can think about is what an if-then uh, uh, is is it's a, it's a kind of division of the plane. So if I say if input 0 is less than 53, that's the same as kind of drawing a line and saying all the points to the left of that are going to be included in one branch of the if-else tree, and they're at one branch of the tree, and all the points on the other side of that line 
are going to be in the other branch. So that's the first division of a binary tree classified along the x-axis with a given threshold. The second level of the tree would then subdivide each successive half of this. So in this particular case, the second level of the tree is, again, if x is less than 39, that represents some new divisor here, which subdivides just the left half into two regions, kind of that intermediate region and then some other region to the left of that one. Following down the tree here, what we see is that the third if then is if input of the y-axis is less than 7. So what that's really now doing is drawing now it, in just this one branch on the left, the blue one, it's drawing a new axis that's horizontal and saying we're going to now break this down into the, part, the, the points that are below or the points that are above that line. So the if-thens correspond to edges that subdivide some region of a two-dimensional plane, and as we get deeper into the tree, it's progressively refined down to smaller regions. Going back to the plot then, you can see how that looks here uh, on, the, on the screen and, and as a plot. The very, the very, there's a vertical line that cuts all the way across. That's the very first division of the tree. And then half the tree is on the left, half the tree is on the right. And then the successive lines are progressively dividing that, that plane into smaller and smaller regions until you get what's called a leaf node that's no longer subdivided. And then simply a label's return. So each, re, each rectangle in this plane corresponds to a leaf node in the decision tree and then returns a single label. And you can see that the shape of this particular data means that there's a number of leaf nodes that return each individual label. Now, in theory, you could this data is simple enough. You probably could look at it by eye and draw some lines through it that would represent kind of reasonable classification boundaries. And you could uh, write that classifier tree by hand. Um, in higher dimensions, that gets much, high, much harder. If you had three or four or five different parameters being used to classify a point, then that gets very difficult to do by eye. And that's where the algorithm comes into play. Using the toolkit lets you generate an optimal tree for a given data set that you can then go back and look at. And often you go back and think more carefully about how to properly label it or how to improve your filtering. And there can be an iterative process to build the tree properly. But still, using the optimal algorithm to generate the tree um, well, it gives you some confidence that you can adjust it if the data changes or you can at least get the best possible segmentation of the data set that you have. So the kit that we're using is called Scikit-Learn. It's a machine learning and Python library that, uh, that itself uses the SciPy library. So it's based on NumPy, SciPy, and we also use Matplotlib for plotting. These are all free open source packages that are easy to install with PIP3, and that, that if you're going to use these tools, you have to install, um, because you need to run the, the algorithm to generate your code. Um, my sample code is just for my system in my application. Um, so part of this is being willing to use offline tools. Um, so Scikit-Learn is, is that sort of top-level package we're using for modeling. So what I've provided for the class is a couple of things. First is uh, a kind of sample script for um, reading the sonar data and doing some filtering on it. And then a, a Python script that can, if once you've labeled that data, it can take that data in and generate a C file. And then the, the, tri the file that we looked at, the classifier demo file itself, this is the output of the script that I wrote. It's using uh, the scikit-learn library to do the actual modeling, and then it's generating code from that in a kind of legible way that works on an Arduino. So that's sort of the, that's kind of the general workflow. Let's look at a couple more details here. Um, so, the key, the first, so the first thing is there is a, uh, you know, a kind of handwritten pipeline for processing the sensor data. So the first thing to note is uh, the sensor data is, pro is uh, acquired at 10 hertz. Uh, in my sample code, the main application here, there's a sort of precision timer. It's using actually the microsecond timer for the Arduino system and using that to generate uh, as close as possible to 10 samples per second exactly. This kind of regular sampling is, is sort of important to have the filters work properly uh, and is a kind of key reason to have a system that uh, can run multiple you know, sort of processing events simultaneously using an event loop. So in this particular pipeline, um, a couple things happen. First, there's a you know it reads the sonar, which sometimes returns just a zero for no ping. Actually, quite often it gets no ping. So the first step is to uh, suppress those zeros, just as a basic sort of sample and hold, where the l the last non-zero value is repeated whenever it doesn't see something. Kind of model in the world is unchanging. It's a default neutral, relatively neutral model for trying to fill in the gaps in the sensor data. Um, that is immediately calibrated uh, using the fmap function from 
the sort of raw microsecond round trip time to a, a notional value in centimeters using an assumed velocity of sound. Uh, it's just, I find it convenient to work in real world units. Uh, building the model in centimeters means that the velocity will be in the centimeters per second. It keeps things uh, kind of in a uniform uh, sensor space. The one thing to be concerned with there is since we are using an integer based model, if you don't choose the right units, you might end up with some underflow. Uh, sometimes scaling your values appropriately using millimeters. Uh, those are ways to keep your numbers within an integer range, um, but still be, be meaningful. Um, the low pass filter here is applied to smooth the data. Um, I'll perhaps approach that in a separate uh, a video, but this is a fourth order uh, one hertz corner frequency Butterworth low pass IIR filter. Um, it's a way of getting rid of the sort of sampling noise. Um, that one hertz boundary is, is low enough to get rid of most of the kind of just the sample to sample noise from the sonar, but still uh, give back reasonable sort of overall gestural motion kind of information. That's also then applied to another uh, a, a filter that is fitting a quadratic to the recent data. It's a Savitsky gole uh, set quadratic interpolator. So that what that yields us actually is a position velocity and actually also acceleration estimate for the current timestamp. Uh, acceleration gets quite noisy. It's hard to use that, but so we're using just the position and velocity. And it's enough to bend things. It's maybe not enough to get like a precision fit to a trajectory, but we're looking at here is basically a more coarse classification of just like getting closer far. So these were set up and tested um, in order to get a reasonable kind of data uh, sort of filtering process that reports, you know, data that can actually be uh, used as for classification. So before I, this final code here shows the classifier in place, but the first step in this was simply to take data using under four different conditions, the four I had mentioned before, um, using the actual filters that will be used in the final system to generate a set of points. And by capturing the four data sets separately, I was able to label them um, using a script that could automatically merge the files. There's always some mis data massaging to throw away kind of extraneous points, kind of the initial startup transients to kind of get a reasonably clean data set. But the idea is to kind of bulk process a, a, you know, a set of labeled categories um, into a training set. There's also a script linked at the bottom of this file that does that merging. It's kind of a throwaway Python script that reads a set of CSV files, labels them by their ordering, and then merges them into one. So that was the first step, and that produced, then I, that was run through the filter generator, I'm um, sorry, the classifier generator, uh, using the scikit-learn algorithm to generate the code that was the classifier. And then in the running, running system, that simply is used right here, the position velocity is uh, taken from the, the fitting filter that's being used to estimate position and velocity for the live data, and then run through the classifier. It's turned into an integer first because we're using an integer classifier, and that returns back this class index that designates what class the points are in. And then th that is actually further processed here with a, with a debounce filter that looks for five uh, identical samples in a row before allowing a change. Even the classifier can be subject to transients. If the motion is right on the boundary between some, some switching boundary between points in the classification tree, it might report extraneous values for just one or two samples. That debounce filter requires the new class to settle into a consistent state before treating it as the new true value. So when you run this whole system, you end up with a graph that looks like, like this. This is a plot that's taken from the serial plotter in the IDE. And the blue line we see here is the filtered position signal. This is already after we've you know, removed zeros, low pass filtered, and fitted the quadratic. And what we get with is like a sort of reasonably smooth approximation of what the world was doing. My, you know, as my hand moved in front of the sensor, how it was moving. The red line is the, veloc is the velocity estimate. And it does include some ringing. It's not entirely clear there what is like physically realistic versus sort of sensor and filter trans or basically artifacts. The ringing is probably from the filtering system, but it's enough to get a, a more or less a binary classification of, of, of motion. At the very least, it changes more dramatically when there is significant uh, motion and stays fairly near zero when there's not. And then the green is the output of the classifier, and it's already been debounced here, so any transients have been removed. What we see is a sort of a, a relatively clean set of states where it goes from the sort of near state to the receding state to the far state, holds there for a while, and then to the approaching state and back to the near state as like the object moves away and back. So this is, this is in the end, the green signal is what you then use to drive other logic about the kind of action of the machine. It's now a reasonably debounced sort of filtered estimate of what the world is doing, but been down into just four categories.
So, um, in two dimensions, it's possible to draw these plots, and that is a, a kind of very convenient way to work just to test things out. Um, one thing to note is that the, the data can be quite high dimensional. Um, the hard part is if you use you know, a, a four element or five element or six element feature vector for classification, it gets harder and harder to get enough meaningful labels. Um, unless the data is actually varying in all those dimensions, um, you need a lot of data to fill that space if it's high dimensional to build a, a sort of meaningful classification scheme. So some, some care is required to think through which attributes will actually indicate in the output um, a meaningful change with regard to the, care, the, the classifications you care about. Um, but those sensor values can, those, those signals can come from different places. Here I'm using position and velocity of the same signal. The multiple, a multiple dimensional, high dimensional or long feature vector could represent different sensors being combined together it could re represent different samples over time. So for example, if you, you think that the underlying process perhaps has uh, some variation over a couple seconds, maybe taking two samples at multiple seconds apart would represent a meaningful differentiator for the different cases. Um, and it can also represent these like, different differentials of the same signal. So that is a definitely a, a, a point that requires some sort of artistry and care and experience to think through which kinds of processes can be applied to the signal to produce useful differentiators that will actually meaningfully classify the output. It's not so easy to automate that part of it. Um, although the key is really once you've gotten the data off the Arduino onto a normal computer, it's much easier to use other tools. Here I'm using open source Python tools, but you could equally well use you know, uh, MATLAB and Octave, other kinds of tools that are useful for plotting data just to kind of look through at the data and try to figure out what attributes of it might be meaningful to represent. So, and that is sort of the end of it. Like the labeling ends up being the big chore here. We need a labeled set and setting up the data collection process to produce labels and then setting up the filtering process to produce sort of meaningful signals. That's, that's sort of the first stage in all of this. Um, but if you can, if you can find a, a solution for that that works, then the automatically uh, derived decision tree can be a useful way to build a classifier over some arbitrary sensor data.